While we are all aware of the struggles relating to racial equality, civil rights, and the cause of liberty that Martin Luther King Jr. faced in the 20th century, the actual movement can be traced back to its abolitionist roots in the 19th century. One of the leaders of this movement was Frederick Douglass, who is best remembered as an activist, author, journalist, and public speaker. The most well-known African American in the United States prior to 1865 was born on the eastern shore of Maryland in February of 1818 to a mother, Betsy Bailey, who was a slave, and an unknown white father. As with the case with many children born into slavery, Douglas was separated from his mother at an early age. At age eight, Douglas was sent to the city of Baltimore to live with Hugh Alt, a relative of Douglas's master, Aaron Anthony. Despite his hard upbringing, Douglas was a very bright and curious child. For a time, Hugh Auld's wife, Sophia Auld, was nice to Douglas and even began to teach him to read. Douglas later bartered food with some of his white playmates for the use of their school's spelling textbooks so that he could continue to learn to read and write. The textbook that influenced Douglas the most was the Columbian Orator, a book that contained stories from the American Revolution with vivid descriptions of important Enlightenment era concepts such as tyranny, liberty, freedom, and rights of man. Interestingly enough, this same textbook played a key role in the education of the young Abraham Lincoln. The fact that Douglas managed to learn to read and write as a boy was an amazing accomplishment that would greatly shape the rest of his life. Both law and custom in slave states forbade slaves from learning to read and write as a way of keeping them ignorant and dependent on their masters. For Douglas, literacy was his first step towards liberation from slavery. Another major influence upon Douglas as a boy was religion. While living in Baltimore, Douglas attended a Methodist church and converted to Christianity around the age of 13 or 14 years old. In the years that followed, Douglas came to study the Bible and was particularly taken with the Hebrew prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah, as well as the prison experiences of the Apostle Paul. At age 17, Douglas moved from Baltimore back to his master's plantation on the eastern shore of Maryland. There he was worked hard as a field slave and was brutally mistreated by an overseer named Edward Covey, who was known as a slave breaker for his ability to break the will of slaves to resist. In a pivotal episode in his time as a slave, Douglas finally decided to stand up to Covey's abuses, even beating him in a fight. Covey never bothered Douglas again after this fight, and for Douglas, it was a moment in which he became a man. Douglas was sent back to Baltimore shortly after his fight with Covey, where he worked in a shipyard and fell in love with a free black woman named Anna Murray. Then, in 1838, Douglas and Anna, taking separate routes to avoid detection, escaped the slave state of Maryland and fled to New York City. The couple were married soon after and began to build a life as freed people in the North. With William Lloyd Garrison as his mentor, Douglas became an important speaker and writer in the abolitionist movement during the early 1840s. Douglas spoke to numerous church and anti-slavery groups in this period and in 1845 published his autobiography entitled The Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass. Douglass's narrative was remarkable in several respects. First, it was extremely well written, which in and of itself cast doubt on the racist allegation that was common in this period that blacks were intellectually inferior to whites. Next, it was deeply gripping in a personal account, comparable to the classics in the genre of autobiography such as St. Augustine's Confessions. Finally, Douglass's narrative detailed the horrors of slavery, giving names, dates, and places as evidence of what he had seen and experienced. Douglass's narrative so well in the North, not to mention the British Isles, France, and the German states. Douglass even went on a speaking tour of the British Isles in 1847 to promote his book. In addition to his support for the abolitionist movement, Douglass was an early supporter of women's equality. He attended the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention and counted a number of women such as Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, as well as anti-slavery activist Julia Griffins as friends, colleagues, and intellectual collaborators. Still, life in the North was far from perfect for Douglas. As a black man, he often experienced racism and discrimination in the North, especially while traveling on speaking tours that he used to both advance the cause of abolitionism and to make a living. 
In the late 1840s and 1850s, his worldview evolved in directions that led to the parting of ways with some of his colleagues. Politically, Douglas came to believe that the U.S. Constitution was fundamentally an anti-slavery document and that political activism was the only way to end slavery. This led to a break between Douglas and William Lord Garrison because Garrison saw the U.S. Constitution as a pro-slavery document and urged moral suasion instead of political action. In 1847, as part of his break with Garrison, Douglas also founded a black newspaper called North Star. On July 5, 1852, to a large audience in Rochester, New York, Douglas delivered arguably what was the most famous speech of his career and one of the greatest speeches in American history, entitled, What to a Slave is the Fourth of July? In this speech, Douglas used biblical imagery, especially from the Hebrew prophet Jeremiah, to vividly condemn the institution of slavery. For Douglas, America may have been Jerusalem for whites, but it was the equivalent of the Babylonian captivity for enslaved blacks. Using strong, vivid language, Douglas attacked the contradiction of an America that on the one hand claimed to celebrate liberty on the 4th of July, while on the other hand allowing the oppression and tyranny of slavery to continue. Likewise, Douglas strongly attacked the religious hypocrisy of white Christians who supported slavery as similar to the religious hypocrites in the New Testament, such as the Pharisees, that Jesus condemned as oppressive and immoral. In his speech, Douglas called America back to its political and religious ideals. And echoing the language of the Hebrew prophets, he warned that America ultimately risked God's judgment if it did not change its ways. During the 1850s, Douglas continued to write and speak against slavery and was briefly associated with radicals such as John Brown, who he saw as a martyr for the abolitionist cause after his execution for attempting to incite a violent slavery rebellion in Virginia in 1859. When the nation became engulfed in the Civil War in the early 1860s, Douglas urged the North to use the war to abolish slavery, even meeting with President Lincoln in an effort to persuade him to make the war about slavery. In a similar vein, after Lincoln did issue the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, Douglas encouraged blacks to serve in the Union Army and strongly opposed any further attempts at colonization which would result in black immigration from America. For Douglas, blacks were fully and completely American. They did not need to leave America, but needed freedom and equality with whites, as he believed it was the most consistent thing with American values of freedom as described in the U.S. Constitution. During Reconstruction, Douglas strongly supported equality and voting rights for black men. However, his stress of voting rights for black men, which meant putting voting rights for women on hold, eventually led to a break between him and key supporters of women's suffrage, most notably Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. In the last decades of his life, Douglas served in notable government positions such as the Marshal of Washington, D.C. and as ambassador to Haiti. Also, in the late 1880s and 1890s, Douglas met with and influenced up-and-coming young African-American leaders such as Booker T. Washington and Ida B. Wells. Douglas was not a perfect person. He had little regard for the mistreatment of Native Americans and was not immune to the nastiness that came with infighting among African American leaders as well as partisan politics nationwide between Republicans and Democrats after the Civil War. Still, on balance, he was an incredible figure who called America to fully end flagrant injustice and embrace its own values of liberty. Douglas died on February 20th, 1895. His legacy as an author and reformer continues to inspire today.